Um, so yeah, as uh, mentioned, today uh, we'll be going on an exploration of context-based security for Kubernetes. Um, so basically, what does that mean? In two words, or a sentence, security that accounts for the workloads running on the clusters. So my name is Ashrat Nir. I'm a storyteller. I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a self-professed yogi, but I am more flexible in mind than in body. And <laughs> I'm the developer advocate for Armo and Cubescape. Uh, in case you've never heard of Armo or Cubescape, uh, I'll do another short intro. Um, so Cubescape is the first Kubernetes security scanner that was accepted by the CNCF. And in the past year or so, uh, it's been a sandbox project. Uh, it's evolved into much more than a security scanner. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to say this so that everybody knows. Uh, we're in a bid for incubation this year. So if you're using Cubescape, please add yourself to the adopters list on GitHub so that we can get to incubation. Thank you. Um, so many of the things that, we put, that I'll be talking about today are in Cubescape, and uh, Armo platform is the enterprise version of Cubescape, and it even takes that to the next level. Uh, it takes all of Cubescape's insights and gives more context and guides to users through the maze of security alerts that we all know and love, right? So, um, you may have caught on by now. <laughs> I'll be talking about Kubernetes security. Um, but I won't be talking about shifting security left. Okay, you've heard that. It's a great idea. Don't stop doing that. Um, but as Timo once told me, you need to look right in order to shift left. And understanding workload behavior is crucial to getting the, cor the correct context for securing Kubernetes from left to right. An interesting quote I found from Shane Lawrence from Shopify, he spoke at KubeCon North America in 2020. He said, no matter how good a job we do on the left, there's always going to be an issue that prevent prevention didn't catch. And I think this is the crux of the issue. Uh, security on the left is typically best practices based, which is great. We've got our benchmarks, we know what to do. Um, but today I want to show you how context elevates it. But let's take a cartoon break. This is a little story um, that I want to clarify by what I mean by contextual security. Um, in this cartoon, sorry, uh, we see two people, they're being attacked by a lion. One is working off the absolute assumption that running away from the lion will save his life. Another knows that her life will be saved if she managed to outrun the other guy. She just needs to ensure that the lion gets to him first. So, it is a gruesome story, it's a not, a not a really good example, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's no absolute security. We have to take the context into account in order to understand the security posture of a system. Now, let's bring that back to the context of my talk, and yes, I did intend that pun. Um, <clears throat> to tell if a vulnerability or a suboptimal setting can be exploited to breach a system, you need to have a full picture of how the system is put together and how it is actually being used by the workloads. If not, you may find yourself fixing security issues that don't matter, and maybe not fixing the ones that do, and thus you're wasting two of your most important resources, time and money. So, Kubernetes security is complex because Kubernetes is not simple. Uh, it's uh, dynamic, um, it's intricate, and it moves all the time. So as an orchestration platform, Kubernetes manages numerous containers, each running different applications, often across various nodes, namespaces, etc. This decentralized architecture offers the scalability and flexibility we all know and love. It also introduces multiple layers of potential security risks, from the workload down to the infrastructure. Kubernetes, many security features may be a little deceptive because you might get the impression that they cover all bases. While they do address most problems related to platform security and offer some extensions around applications and networks, such as Kubernetes secrets and native network policies, these don't automatically translate to securing everything layered on top or below. Securing these other layers are included in existing domains such as AppSec, platform security, and cloud security. And you know the drill. If everybody's 
in charge, nobody's in charge. So, to get effective Kubernetes security, it requires a comprehensive approach that encompasses the application, infrastructure, networking, access control, and an awareness of the constantly evolving threat landscape. Using all these information streams to provide context to Kubernetes security yields the best results. It provides users with a better understanding of the system's overall security posture. To put this in perspective, let's use an example. Think about an application that has a vulnerability that can be exploited by an attacker who has network level access to the application. If we know, sorry, there's my slide, um, that this application can only receive requests from other applications inside the cluster, that's one thing. If it can be accessed from the public internet, then the problem is in a whole different ballpark. Now, if we add on to that the default behavior of RBAC settings, which allow a pod to get a service account token, which gives its access to the Kubernetes API, this situation potentially leaves you open to impersonation, lateral movement, et cetera, which is not only a different ballpark, it's now a whole different ball game. The good news is that a Kubernetes cluster has access to plenty of data streams that can be used by security practitioners to ensure the security and integrity of the environment. So let's talk about them. I'll start with the Kubernetes API. The Kubernetes API, as we all know, is the central nervous system of a Kubernetes cluster, offering comprehensive insight into the state and management of cluster resources. Security practitioners can monitor the state of the cluster using the API, making sure that the configuration is secure and to detect unusual patterns in the state of the cluster. This information is also invaluable to put other in information streams into context, since people aren't working with classical constructs like TCP connections or only processes, but in the context of Kubernetes workloads. The next stream we'll be looking at is logging, which is not only important for operations and governance, Kubernetes audit logs are invaluable for security monitoring and forensic analysis as well. They record a chronological account of requests made to the Kubernetes API, detailing who made the request, what was requested, and the outcome of the request. This data is crucial for detecting and investigating security incidents, ensuring compliance, and understanding the context of operational changes. The third data stream I'll talk about is role-based access control, or RBAC. I already mentioned RBAC in an example earlier. What I'd like to stress here is that it is fundamental to enforcing the principle of least privilege. By examining RBAC configurations, security practitioners can ensure that users and services have only the permissions necessary for their function, minimizing the risk of privilege escalation and unauthorized access. While it's possible to maintain and audit RBAC through the CLI using kubectl commands, that is a very long and involved process. As a result, there are many solutions on the market, like Armo Platform, that help with this by offering, Kuber, uh, by offering RBAC visualization, making this whole search of who's who in the zoo, like the example here, show subjects with all privileges on a resource, making it much easier to find. Okay, another data stream is the awareness of what's going on around us. So that would be vulnerabilities or CVEs in this case. Um, so these are the main sources of alert fatigue. The graph on the slide shows an analysis I did with the Armo security team, uh, the Armo security research team, sorry. Uh, we took a look at some of your favorite images and found them to be riddled with vulnerabilities. This is old data, it's like maybe a year old or a little more, but you get the idea. Um, 
Security teams must stay informed about any vulnerabilities within these images to take timely action. Tools that scan container images for known vulnerabilities and provide detailed reports are essential to maintaining a secure container environment. I think this data stream is the most used one, and I think it might be the, most, the one that causes everybody the most angst as well. So, another thing is, is that the security of a Kubernetes cluster also depends heavily on the security of its nodes. You should basically adopt the same security strategies for securing Kubernetes nodes that you would to, use to secure any type of server. This includes understanding the operating system details, ensuring they're up to date with patches, validating installation configurations, monitoring, sorry, monitoring node health and security posture is critical to safeguarding the underlying infrastructure that supports the cluster. So node information is a key data stream that security can use to build context. This isn't a data stream. This is a tool. Anybody heard, about, heard the buzz about eBPF? There was a talk this morning, right? <laughs> so yeah. Um, eBPF enables detailed observability and security monitoring within a Kubernetes cluster. It provides deep visibility into processes, file activity, network traffic, system calls, and all of this at the kernel level without modifying the kernel or the applications. So while eBPF itself is just a tool, it's a very good tool to extract data that is applicable to security. This allows for real-time security monitoring and performance troubleshooting. And it offers security practitioners a powerful tool to observe and secure applications running in the cluster. So, I just li listed a bunch of problems and possibly only hinted at solutions, and I know that can be annoying. But I come equipped with solutions, so give me a few minutes. Remember those uh, CVE-riddled images from before? Well, the solution lies with CVE reachability. It's a new approach in container security, newer, I guess, uh, it leverages the power of eBPF to enhance the accuracy and efficiency of vulnerability management. At the core of CVE reachability is the understanding that not all software packages in a container are actively used in runtime. We know this from how we build containers, right? Um, traditional vulnerability scans of container images often flag all known vul vulnerabilities in every package included in the image, regardless of whether those packages are in use or not. Uh, and typically, the best practice these days is to say, OK, no criticals and highs. But maybe that's just a waste of time and effort as well. Um, so because this approach often results in a large number of false positives, and that burdens the security teams with the task of sifting through these results to identify the genuine threats or work through all of the high and critical CVEs. By employing eBPF, CVE reachability highlights the software packages that are actually used during container runtime. It monitors and records the file accesses made by the container, provides precise data on which parts of the container image are active. With this information, security practitioners can then filter the results of vulnerability scans to focus solely on the vulnerabilities that are present in the active packages or are running in memory. So this approach offers benefits such as reduction in false positives and focusing on threats that are real today. It presents a more precise and efficient method for managing vulnerabilities. And it significantly reduces the burden on security teams and enhances the overall security of Kubernetes environments. EBF, eBPF observability also extends to network interactions. By monitoring which external entities a workload communicates with, eBPF can help in creating accurate network policies. These policies restrict network access to only those communications that are necessary for the workload's operation, thereby reducing the attack surface and preventing potential lateral movement with, of threats within the network. 
System calls, they are how program requests a service from the operating system's kernel. eBPF can monitor the system calls made by the workload, providing exact insight into, this, into its interaction with the operating system. With this data, security teams can create SecComp profiles, or by their full name, Linux Secure Computing Mode profiles. I dare you to remember that. Um, that precisely define which, systems, which system calls are permitted for a given workload. This can get lost in the mix due to it falling between the cracks of DevOps, security, and dev. No one group mentioned has a holistic view of what an application actually uses. Hence, this level of control is typically hard to achieve manually due to the vast number of potential system calls and the difficulty in predicting which ones an application actually requires. And nobody, is there anybody here that wants to break an application in production? Huh? Huh? No, 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 no. Nobody wants to break an application. By observing which capabilities a workload actually utilizes, security teams can tailor the permissions to fit the workload's specific needs, ensuring that only necessary capabilities are enabled. So those were a, f a handful of, of disparate use cases, and they all use eBPF explicitly. When we're talking about attack paths, it doesn't rely on eBPF explicitly, but it does provide that holistic view that I was talking about. The concept of attack paths in a Kubernetes environment revolves around the identification and analysis of routes an attacker could potentially exploit to compromise the system or its assets. Detecting these attacks, these attack paths, sorry, requires a multi-dimensional approach considering various aspects of the cluster's configuration and state. To effectively identify potential attack paths, it's necessary to integrate and analyze information from multiple sources within the Kubernetes ecosystem. This includes data from network configurations, workload behaviors, security vulnerabilities, access control, and more. Consider a Kubernetes workload that is configured to receive traffic from the public internet. This configuration detail can be gleaned from the Kubernetes settings, such as ingress rules, we haven't talked about ingress for a while, right? Uh, or service types. Um, suppose the same workload is identified by a vulnerability scanner as having critical security vulnerabilities. This information adds another layer to the security assessment. Combining all of it results in flagging a heightened risk for that particular workload. Furthermore, let's say the workload has a mounted secret, which could be sensitive data or credentials necessary for its operation. You choose. This aspect introduces the potential for data exposure or unauthorized access if the workload is compromised. By looking at all the information collectively, the public internet exposure, the identified vulnerabilities, and the access to sensitive data, a holistic security system can deduce that the mounted secret is at risk of being compromised by external threats. This realization forms the basis of an attack path. An external actor could potentially exploit the vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access to the secret. So this method of combining multiple data sources to identify attack paths can be applied to various other scenarios in a Kubernetes environment. Each scenario will have its own unique configurations, vulnerabilities, and access controls. But they collectively indicate a po potential attack vectors. This approach underscores the importance of contextual security analysis in Kubernetes. By integrating data from multiple sources, security systems can map out possible attack paths, thus enabling security teams to preemptively address vulnerabilities, tighten configurations, and safeguard sensitive data. Such proactive measures are vital in mitigating the risk of attacks and maintaining the integrity and security of Kubernetes clusters. Since I have a few more seconds on this slide, I can also tell you the neat thing about attack paths 
is that if you break them in only one place, you're good. So you don't have to go through the whole, the whole nine yards and solve all of the problems. It's enough to break the attack path. So you have all the holistic view, and then you have the attack path, and then you know where to block it, and you're good. Of course, you keep monitoring, you keep looking, and you keep checking because security is a moving target. So, to conclude, there are many information sources to inform, that inform Kubernetes security. Looking to industry benchmarks is a really good start, but it's just a start. Adding a layer of context onto those best practices is the only way you'll be able to create and maintain secure Kubernetes infrastructure in a way that is applicable to the workloads you are running. Many of the things I mentioned are really hard and resource intensive to do manually. This toil is begging to be automated. Cubescape automates much of what I mentioned. Arma platform takes it even a step further. So thank you for listening. Does anybody have questions? Because I left time for questions. <laughs> One second. OK, so thanks, thanks. So thanks for listening through my speed talk. <laughs> um, and um, if you'd like to keep in touch with me, um, Oshrat N on all of the socials I exist on, because I'm not on all of the socials. You can follow Armo or, um, on LinkedIn or X, which is Twitter, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, and if you're interested in Kubernetes security, uh, you can, you're, you're more than welcome to join the Cubescape community. You can check it out on X or GitHub. Uh, there are also Cubescape channels on the CNCF Slack. If you'd like to continue the conversation, I have plenty of time, so I'm good. <laughs> I'll talk slowly. I'll make five minutes. If you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, you can come visit the Armo booth at KubeCon starting uh, Wednesday. And on Wednesday and Friday during the second shift at the Sandbox Projects, you can speak to Cubescape maintainers at a Cubescape kiosk at the CNCF Project Pavilion. And if you're using Cubescape, add yourself to the adopters list. Thank you so much.